I am Amber, DBT social media manager. And um, we are humans before everything else that we do. We are humans first before we are employees, before we are CEOs, entrepreneurs, and so on and so on. So we believe that taking care of ourselves must always come first before anything else because we do our best when we are our best. So we are the best employees when we are our best. We are the best CEOs, the best entrepreneurs, the best business owners, and the best, the best employers when we are our best. And so this is why we are excited as the DV team, not only to host the session, but to guide the Quella team to guide you into your health and wellness journey because we believe that it does not end with this session and we hope that going forward you will actually be taking some of these tips and including them, including them into your day-to-day -day life. So the session will be led by two of our fantastic ladies, Rachel Kijel, who is one of our health um, coaching partners and she'll be unpacking diets and reimagining healthy eating for the business professional on the go and then next up will be Kelsey Rod who is our healthcare ambassador and she'll be unpacking movement its importance and why we believe it is one of the best medicines for employees so over to you Rachel cool thank you I'm just gonna share my screen Let's see here. Cool. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're good. Cool. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Kidgel, and I'm here to discuss the importance of healthy eating, both everyday life and work productivity. Having been diagnosed with IBS at a young age, I've always had an appreciation for healthy eating. However, after completing my BCom law in 2020, in 2021, I began studying an LLB and fell into the habit of working 24 seven and paying little attention to my overall health. After many tears, sleepless nights and poor dietary choices, I realized that sacrificing my health for work was unsustainable and that my time would be better spent sharing this message with others. I am now studying my honors in HR as well as health coaching with the ultimate goal of improving employee wellness which brings me to our discussion today. We're going to begin by discussing the importance of healthy eating with an emphasis on productivity. We'll then examine the most basic healthy eating principles and the functions of each food group before discussing meal prep and a couple extra healthy eating habits. Before I share my advice on healthy eating principles, I'd like to highlight that my purpose as a health coach is to help you achieve optimal health, not weight loss. Somehow society has confused health with weight, and while in some circumstances the two do overlap, and there is generally nothing wrong with the weight loss goal, the average individual needs to stop focusing solely on their weight, often at the expense of their health, and begin to prioritize their health instead. And so the knowledge I share with you today does not promise quick weight loss, but rather sustainable health from the inside out. And what is healthy and sustainable is balance. How many of us start the week off eating chicken breasts and roast vegetables and end the week with several beers and half price pizza? Let me know in the chat box if this sounds like you, because I promise you're not alone. Many of us, myself included, have made commitments to never eating anything unhealthy at the start of the year, month or week, but find ourselves failing three days in and shift our commitment to the following year, month or week. Or we've tried every diet under the sun, keto, low calorie, paleo, you name it. Or we followed numerous bad health trends, skinny tea, apple cider vinegar, or celery juice. Often such trends and diets lead to eventual binging, guilt around food, or even disordered eating. Furthermore, 95% of such diets result in the individual regaining any weight they lose, and two-thirds of such individuals ultimately gaining more weight than they had before, and inevitably becoming less healthy. So check the chat here. Please feel free. The approach that instead resonates with me is balance. In 80, sorry, I'm still changing slides. Okay, we're good. <laughs> the approach that instead resonates with me as a future health coach and having tried all the various diets myself is an 80-20 approach in which 80% of our food is healthy and 20% a little less healthy. Eating like this means nourishing our bodies and prioritizing our health, but still living life without deprivation. And if 80-20 sounds steep, start with 50-50 and work your way up, little by little. One of my favorite quotes that has inspired my own health journey is to meet yourself where you're at. So with all the advice I'll give today, meet yourself where you're at and start with small but easy changes. 
So why eat healthy? What's the point? We've all heard the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And honestly, there is some truth in this. In 2021, the World Health Organization reported that 71% of deaths annually are caused by non-communicable diseases, meaning diseases caused by genetic, physiological, environmental, or behavioral factors. These include cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer, often caused by smoking, excess alcohol, poor diets, and lack of exercise. Thus, in simply prioritizing your own health, as well as the, as well as the health of those around you, you can prolong both your own life and the life of others. Furthermore, how we eat not only enables us to live longer, but also impacts our daily health and productivity too. A study done at a textile factory in Guatemala City found that adequate nutrition at work can increase employee productivity by 20%. This is because when we eat well, we have better energy and are therefore more productive throughout the day. If we eat refined carbohydrates and highly processed foods, we experience a spike in our blood sugar levels and then a sudden drop, giving us a quick energy boost and then sudden decline. When we eat whole grain unprocessed foods, however, our blood sugar steadily increases and slowly decreases, resulting in sustained energy throughout the day. This in turn leads to better focus and better productivity. Furthermore, scientists now suggest that we have what they call a gut-brain axis, which indicates that our gut and brain are in constant communication, and thus a healthy, well-functioning gut leads in turn to a healthy, well-functioning brain. This suggests that if you'd like to increase either your own productivity or that of your employees, the place to start is with healthy, nourishing meals. This may mean either including these meals in your own diet or ensuring that these meals are available within the office. Majority of the research done thus far, however, concludes that the biggest impact of healthy workplace nutrition is a reduction in employee absenteeism. 70% of our immune system resides within the gut, and so the healthier you eat, the healthier your immune system. This results in fewer sick days and ultimately lower absenteeism. Research in 2014 found that 15% of South African employees are absent from work daily, and that absenteeism costs the South African economy roughly 16 billion rand annually. This is expected to have increased since COVID, and so it has become more important than ever that we take care not only of our own health, but that of employees' health too. And finally, when we consume the requisite vitamins and minerals, not only do we feel better, but we have stronger bones and muscles too, making daily movement less painful. A study by Rand Europe found that those with musculoskeletal health conditions report higher rates of absenteeism than those without, highlighting the essentiality of caring for our bone health. And because a lot of corporate jobs require one to sit at their desk for up to nine hours, five days a week, strengthening our bones and muscles through the food we eat is essential. And ultimately, it is vital that healthy foods are made readily available to those working in such a corporate environment. So now you know why you should eat healthy, but how do you do it? My job today is to share with you what this healthy diet looks like. You may think that you're too busy to follow a healthy lifestyle, but I'm here to prove otherwise. Let's jump right in. We'll check the chat before I move on. We cannot see the speaker's video. Um, yeah, my video isn't on. I've got, can you see my slides? The slides are good, yeah. Okay, I can put the video on. Uh, oh, it says the host has stopped my video, so I can't, sorry. But as long as you can see all the slides, it should be good. Cool. Okay, the most basic principle that you should understand is that of the balanced plate. The balanced plate suggests that every meal and snack that you consume should comprise of 50% fruit and non-starchy vegetables, 25% protein and 25% whole grain carbohydrates, starchy vegetables, with a little bit of fat alongside. This is my favorite principle because it can be followed in whatever situation you find yourself, be it cooking meals at home or eating out at a restaurant or cafeteria. If you only take one thing away from this talk, let it be the balanced plate. It's worth noting, however, that this is the benchmark to eating well. So if you're currently not eating any fruit or vegetables, don't suddenly change your diet to include 50% fruit and veg. Rather begin to include just one spoon of vegetables onto your plate for a week and slowly build up to this balanced plate. So let's now discuss each of these food groups in a little more depth. Most of us know that we should consume three to five servings of fruit and vegetables per day, but experts have recently discovered that we should in fact eat up to 10 servings of fruit and vegetables daily. 
and that what is just as important is that we consume a variety of fruit and vegetables, as each has different nutrients which nourish our gut bacteria. It is now recommended that we eat 30 different plant fibers per week. This may sound like an overwhelming number, but before you panic, beyond all fruit and vegetables, this also includes whole grains, beans and pulses, seeds, herbs and spices. So in reality, a simple curry could include up to 10 of these sources. I've provided you with a little tracker on which you can record your own intake of plants to discover how many you're currently eating and if you should attempt to increase it. So each day you can just put down the fruits that you eat, but don't repeat it. The idea is that you need to get 30 different plant fruits, plant fibers. So if you have a nectarine today and you have a nectarine tomorrow, you only put the nectarine down once. But then if you have a nectarine and then you have a plum, you put the nectarine and then you put the plum. Okay. My top tips to increase the number of plants to eat are to add mixed seeds to salads, porridges, stews, etc. It's such a simple way to increase your variety without truly affecting the taste of these dishes. Add a new fruit or vegetable to your diet each week. If you generally have peas with your dinner, next time choose peas and carrots, and the next time choose peas, carrots, and corn. This is an easy way to increase your variety while also experimenting with new ingredients. Grate vegetables such as carrots and zucchini into curries, minces, and stews. This will enhance the flavor of the meal while also incorporating vegetables into it. Do not fear frozen fruit and vegetables. Frozen fruit and veg are a cheap and convenient way to increase your fiber intake and are no less nutritious than their fresh counterparts. Because they're not as affected by shelf life and long travel journeys, they can in fact be healthier than some fruit, fresh fruit and vegetables. Practice cooking with different vegetables. When cooked and seasoned well, vegetables can truly be delicious and at times be the star of the dish, not just a sad side dish you must force yourself to eat. Buy pre-chopped vegetables. If you can afford the extra cost, it's definitely worth it as it makes your cooking process so much quicker. And let's face it, after a long day at work, the quicker the cooking, the better. Hide vegetables into dishes. My favorite is steamed cauliflower hidden in a white sauce. Honestly, you can't even taste the cauliflower. If you have any of your own tips, please feel free to share in the chat box. I'd also like to just note that as you increase your fiber intake, you need to simultaneously increase your water intake as fiber absorbs water as it transitions through our gut. And as such, a sudden increase in fiber could result in diarrhea or constipation. So every time you try a new plant fiber, simply have a glass of water alongside it, aiming for around two liters of water daily. So I said, let me just check the chat box. Seeds and salads are definitely my go-to. Same, I love them. <laughs> okay. I'd also like to just note that as you increase your fiber intake, you need to simultaneously increase your water intake as fiber absorbs water as it transitions through our gut. And as such, a sudden increase in fiber could result in diarrhea or constipation. So every time you try a new plant fiber, simply have a glass of water alongside it, aiming for around two liters of water daily. So that I'm just, sorry, I repeated that because if you have seeds in your salad, Make sure you're having water as well, because the seeds can definitely result in diarrhea or constipation. Okay, so I said that 50% of your plate should comprise fruit and non-starchy vegetables, with the other 25% being whole grain carbohydrates or starchy vegetables. What does this mean? The percentage of carbohydrate present in non-starchy vegetables is much lower than that in starchy vegetables. And as such, non-starchy vegetables are broken down slowly in our gut, causing a lesser spike in our blood sugar levels. This may sound like a complicated caveat to the balanced plate, but all you really need to know is that starchy vegetables include peas, corn, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. All other vegetables are considered non-starchy. And what about fruit? Fruit is good for you. There's a popular misconception that because fruit has sugar, it is not healthy. However, fruit is packed with vital vitamins and minerals essential to daily health. Fruit does contain fructose, but because it is packed with fiber, the fructose is not harmful. As somebody with a sweet tooth, Fruits are my favorite snack and an easy way to get a little healthy sugar into my blood when I need it. What should be limited, however, is your intake of fruit juice, as when fruit is juiced, all the fiber is removed and only the sugar remains. So while the occasional fruit juice can definitely be part of a healthy diet, it is worth noting that it in itself is not necessarily the healthiest option. And what about dried fruit? Dried fruit is high in fiber, vitamins, and minerals, and at times a more convenient way to consume fruit on the go. It is, however, a more concentrated form of fructose than fresh fruit, and so the recommended serving sizes are a little lower. The average serving size of fresh fruit is about half a cup, while the serving size of dried fruit is a quarter of a cup. 
So although I definitely recommend consuming dried fruit as a convenient healthy snack, just be mindful of your portion sizes. On to carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are not the devil they're made out to be. They are in fact the body's preferred source of energy and contain many essential nutrients. They should therefore be consumed at every single meal. What should be limited, however, is your intake of refined carbohydrates, such as white bread, white rice, white pasta, cakes, and cookies. These carbohydrates have a high glycemic index and as mentioned above, cause your blood sugar to spike before suddenly dropping, giving you an energy high and then sudden low. The carbohydrates which should be consumed regularly are the whole grain carbs, which have a low glycemic index. These carbs give you sustained energy and feed your gut bacteria. These include whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, durum wheat pasta, and basmati rice. The simplest way to distinguish between high GI and low GI carbs are that brown and seeded carbs are generally good for you, while white carbs are often a little less good for you. So if you're ever in a rush and stop to buy a quick lunch at the garage, opt for the brown bread sandwich or bulgur wheat salad over the chicken pie. Protein. Protein supports all our body cells, muscles, bones, skin, and nails, and makes up our enzymes, hormones, and antibodies, and is not just exclusively for the gym bros. Proteins are made up of amino acids, most of which are produced in our body. However, nine particular amino acids are found exclusively in our diet, and thus protein should be consumed at every meal and at an even distribution throughout the day, not only at dinner, as many of us do. I just want to emphasize that point because a lot of people have like carbs for breakfast, carbs for lunch, and then have a steak for dinner. And as great as a steak is for your protein, you need to have a little bit of protein at breakfast, a little bit of protein at lunch, and a little bit of protein at dinner. Okay, so protein can be found in both plant and animal sources. I'll discuss each separately. Protein is found in all animal sources, and as such, animal foods have historically been the preferred source of protein. White meat, such as chicken and fish, is low in saturated fat and can be consumed daily if desired. When purchasing red meat, opt for extra lean to lean cuts and consume it only once or twice a week, as it is high in saturated fat, which may lead to poor heart health. Processed meats, such as ham and bacon, should also be limited due to their high salt and trans fat content. Protein is also found in a number of plant sources, such as beans and legumes, and it is possible to meet your protein requirements when following a plant-based diet. It is recommended, however, to take a vitamin B12 supplement and to monitor your iron, calcium, and omega-3 intake if following a purely plant-based diet, as these are found predominantly in animal sources. Furthermore, it is recommended that if you have no animal source of protein in your meal, that you always combine different sources of plant proteins in order to absorb all nine essential amino acids. For example, have a salad with black beans and chickpeas or a curry with rice and lentils. Alternatively, opt for soy products such as tofu or edamame beans as soy itself does contain all nine essential amino acids. Protein should comprise 25% of each of your meals. And if you do eat animal sources, it is most beneficial to include both animal and plant proteins in your diet to ensure you're not deficient in any necessary vitamins or minerals. We do, however, often serve bigger portions of protein than necessary, particularly when eating meat. So when serving protein at a meal, aim for an amount equal to the size of your palm, as that will provide the requisite vitamins and minerals for a body of your size. Now, if anybody ever tells you that fat makes you fat, you, could, you have my permission to pull a will and slap them across the face. Fats are essential for energy, cell growth, absorption of nutrients, and keeping your cholesterol and blood pressure at bay. Plus, they're great for satiety, ensuring we feel more satisfied with our meal. Recent studies have also found that consuming fat with a meal slows down the rate that sugar is released into your bloodstream and increases the vitamin and mineral absorption. While the recommended portion sizes of fats are relatively low, they should be consumed at every meal and snack. The fats to prioritize are unsaturated fats, such as extra virgin olive oil, nuts, and avocados. The fats to limit include margarine and coconut oil. When purchasing processed foods, check the nutrition label and ideally choose foods with less than five grams of saturated fat per 100 grams. That brings us on to dairy. In the past, health professionals have advocated choosing low fat dairy because it is relatively high in saturated fat i.e. the bad fat. However, recent studies have discovered that the saturated fat present in dairy responds differently in our body to saturated fats and other foods, and that full-fat dairy is richer in essential vitamins than low-fat or fat-free dairy, 
making it the area of choice amongst health experts. However, because these studies are still emerging, my advice is to simply choose the dairy that you most enjoy. So I really don't wanna come here and take anything away from your diet, but because, but because in both my studies and my experience, health is truly about what you add to your diet, not what you take away. However, in discussing health, I do have to touch on caffeine and alcohol and why we should limit, not remove, but limit our intake of these drinks. Let's start with caffeine. Let me know if you're one of the people who can't be spoken to until you've had your morning coffee. This is okay. Caffeine is not inherently bad for you. It is an easy way to increase your energy levels and improve alertness. Plus, it's tasty and a part of daily life. However, recent studies have found that caffeine has, on average, a six-hour half-life. This means that if you have a cup of coffee containing 100 milligrams of caffeine at 4 p.m., at 10 p.m. that night, there's still 50 milligrams of caffeine inside of you. This consequently leads to poor sleep. And I already know some of you are thinking, oh, well, I can have a coffee right before bed and still fall straight asleep. And while that may be the case, what is still being affected is your sleep quality. And poor sleep quality results in low energy and low productivity. Furthermore, studies have found that those with poor sleep habits eat an average of 300 more calories daily than those who sleep well. Because <laughs> Alda said, sure, at least only one or two cups in the mornings. And that's perfect because caffeine isn't inherently bad for you. And in the mornings it can keep you awake, but at night time it's going to keep you awake as well. And that's not when we want to be awake. So my advice is to enjoy your coffee with the daily caffeine recommendation for the average adult being up to four cups of coffee or eight cups of caffeinated tea daily. But try to eliminate it as early as possible. It is recommended that you avoid caffeine after noon. But if this seems ridiculous, at least try to cut it out a couple of hours before going to bed. And if you love the taste of tea or coffee, simply opt for decaf versions of these drinks in the afternoon. And if possible, try them without the milk and sugar. I'd also like to note that caffeine withdrawal is 100% real, causing headaches, nausea, and poor concentration. And so as with anything, start small. Don't cut out caffeine all in one go. Rather swap it out one cup at a time. Now for alcohol. Who's familiar with this cycle? Get blackout drunk on a Saturday night, feel hungover the Sunday morning, and swear off of alcohol forever, and then repeat the process again the following weekend. If this sounds like you, then listen up. We've all heard that a glass of red wine is good for us, and it's true. In moderation, red wine has been associated with better heart health. However, in excess, alcohol leads to many health issues, such as liver cirrhosis, high blood pressure, heart disease, or even depression, and it is therefore vital that you consume it in moderation. So what does moderation mean? It is advised that men consume no more than two alcoholic drinks daily, and women no more than one alcoholic drink daily. Many experts consider even this advice to be a little high. And ultimately, I would advise against consuming alcohol every day, but a little bit each week is all right. Furthermore, when having alcohol up to lower sugar drinks, while the occasional cocktail is perfectly acceptable, the high sugar content and mixed in spirits means it's not considered an alcoholic drink that should be consumed regularly. Ultimately, if you like to drink alcohol and you're not dependent on it to feel better, then go ahead and enjoy it moderately, but remain cautious as it is addictive and with time, its costs do outweigh its benefits. Another one of my favorite quotes is don't drink to feel better, only drink to feel even better, which ultimately implies that we shouldn't rely on alcohol when you're feeling down, but a little bit when you're already feeling good is perfectly acceptable. Do we have any questions at this point before I move on to the next section? No typing, so I'm gonna move on. So now you know these healthy eating principles, how can you incorporate them into your own lives? Let's start with meal prep. Meal prep may sound like a daunting, time-consuming task performed only by those who sweat green juice and live at the gym, but it is in reality a quick and easy way to save time while still enjoying healthy, nourishing meals. So what is meal prep? Meal prep comes in many different forms, but essentially it is the act of preparing other meals or ingredients prior to needing them, so that when you need a healthy meal, you do not need to spend hours creating one. You can meal prep whenever it suits you best. For many, it's a Sunday afternoon, and for others, it's the day they go grocery shopping. There are three popular ways to meal prep. First, once or twice a week, you could make a couple of meals, divide them into the number of portions you may need the next few days, and store them as such. Then when you need a meal, you just whip one out and you're good to go. Good meals to prep include pasta dishes, curries, stews, or overnight oats. 
Alternatively, you could prepare a number of ingredients, such as roast vegetables, chicken breasts, boiled eggs, and whole wheat couscous, and store these ingredients in bulk. Then when you need a meal, you simply take out the ingredients you'd like and prepare it. Lastly, any time you cook, you could prepare more than you need, freeze or refrigerate the leftovers, and enjoy whenever. This works perfectly for mints or curries, which often taste better the next day. Ultimately, the idea behind each of these is that if you have your meals or ingredients prepared beforehand, when you're in a rush, you won't rely on fast food, but instead can simply fetch a meal from your fridge or freezer, saving you health, time, and money. My brother is a paramedic and as such works long hours many days a week and used to live off of fast food. I've spent much of my time encouraging him to prioritize his health and have faced a lot of reluctance therein. But after suggesting he try meal prep and spend a little time each week cooking, I've become his favorite sister. He now meal preps at the start of each week and not only has his health and energy improved, but he has saved so much money as we all know convenience food comes at a high cost. Furthermore, through meal prep, he has lost five kilograms. And while you know I do not necessarily equate health with weight loss, his personal goal was to lose weight. And I think it is worth noting to simply highlight the effects of merely cooking one's own food. So if you've been wanting to meal prep but haven't yet taken the plunge, this is your time, time to start now. And if you really don't like cooking but still want to eat well, we live amongst an abundance of pre-made meal delivery services. These organizations make and deliver the meals to you, enabling you to eat well without having to cook. I'd recommend giving these a try if you'd rather not cook. <laughs> I've included a couple in your handout. How many of you make school lunches for your children each day, but not yourself, with the intention of just grabbing something at work? This tip is short and sweet, but ultimately my point is to stop relying on the business cafeteria, or worse, vending machine for lunch, and simply take a pre-made meal and healthy snacks with you. Like my brother in the example before, not only will your health improve, but so will your bank balance. Have you ever been in this situation? You get a packet of chips from the cupboard to have a little snack. You think a few handfuls should be good. Check Instagram, message a friend on WhatsApp, film a TikTok, update your LinkedIn, create a Snapchat account, get a subscription to the New York Times, and oh my God, you've finished your chips. Mindful eating means being mentally present with the food you consume by tuning in to each of your five senses. The purpose therein is to connect with your food, enjoy it fully, and honor your cues of fullness. Many of us feel that we're too busy to sit down and simply enjoy a meal, and as such, choose to eat on our phones, in front of our TV or laptops. But these distractions prevent us from genuinely enjoying and understanding how food is currently serving us, be it emotionally or physically. As such, we shovel down the food without truly appreciating it and find ourselves hungry within a short period of time. When we eat mindfully, however, we are able to truly enjoy the food we eat and recognize when it's time to stop. I know we all lead busy lives and in all honesty, I eat breakfast most mornings while scrolling through Instagram. So I'm still working on this myself, but I've spent time ensuring I eat my lunches and dinners without such distractions and I've truly experienced the benefits firsthand. So I challenge you as busy business professionals to eat at least one meal per day for the next week without any distractions and discover how much better your eating experience becomes. Alternatively, prioritize eating with friends or family. This not only makes your eating experience more enjoyable, but encourages you to slow down and enjoy your food. Raise your hand if you've ever worked through lunch or skipped a meal because you're too busy to eat. And then when you do finally eat, you're so starving that you finish your meal in 0.7 seconds. So many business professionals find their lunch hour to be a good time to catch up on emails or finalize a project. But I'm here to tell you to utilize your lunch hour because it is there for a reason. When we do not eat, our blood sugar levels drop and so too do our energy levels, causing an eventual decrease in productivity. Furthermore, when we skip meals and enter our next meal starving, we often eat more than we need and fail to enjoy the benefits of that meal. So if you have the option to take even a 10 minute lunch break, do it. Not only will you feel better physically, but you'll be more productive and your brain can function optimally. This goes for working both at the office and at home. On top of that, be sure you're eating at least three solid meals daily with a couple of snacks in between if you're still hungry. On that note, while there's nothing wrong with a couple of snacks throughout the day, opt for healthy snacks and ensure you're snacking because you're hungry, not bored. To do so, simply ask yourself, why am I choosing this snack? How will it benefit me? It's okay to occasionally eat out of boredom or because we're feeling sad. 
But if you're doing this regularly, just check in with yourself and see how you could better serve yourself in that situation. A couple of healthy snacks that would serve you better than chips or chocolate include mixed nuts, opt for mixed for variety, biltong, fruit, or unsweetened yogurt. My advice is to keep these healthy snacks on hand wherever you go. This way, you'll never find yourself at mercy to the vending machine. Let us know if you have any of your own favorite healthy snacks. And what about breakfast? Some people love it, some hate it. Studies have found that those who consume breakfast do tend to have better health markers. So if you do enjoy eating breakfast, then great, keep it up, but ensure you're following the balanced plate approach. And if you only have time for cereal, aim for whole grain cereals, such as whole grain oat cereals, and enjoy some fruit on the side. And for those who dislike eating first thing in the morning, the evidence is not so overwhelming that you should force yourself to eat breakfast, as food should always be enjoyed. So simply eat when you do feel hungry. And again, follow the balanced plate approach. All right, Kelsey's shared some quick and easy meal prep recipes. That's really nice. It's on the uh, YouTube channel there. So that's a good link to go to if you want to know what to meal prep. Cool. So my final point for today is to spend some time grocery shopping. Instead of rushing through the grocery store and grabbing the items you always buy, take a little time to look at the variety available and choose something a little different. Now, obviously, this takes time, and so I don't suggest you do it every time you shop, but try it out occasionally to ensure you're choosing the best the shops have to offer. And if this still sounds daunting, you can even do it online. Almost all grocery stores have apps now, meaning you can browse the shop from the comfort of your bed if necessary. There are certain items I buy to make cooking 10 times quicker that I recommend everyone consider. These include pre-cooked rice, pre-made pasta, pre-made curry packs, pre-chopped vegetables, even onions, so no tears there, and pre-made stir-fry sauces. Some of these may have a higher salt content than desired, but they're better than the alternative McDonald's drive through when you're not up to cooking. What are some of your guys' favorite convenient items? This way there. Okay. Finally, I've shared with you a couple of recipes that you can make at home to ease you into the process of eating well. I've included an overnight oats recipe for those who have little time to make breakfast. A chickpea curry to increase your intake of plant protein, a date and peanut butter snack, and an easy 20 minute beef stir fry. If you guys have any other recipes, so feel free to share and share links to YouTube or all the apps to share whatever you've got to offer. So, oat bake last. Yeah, Grisalda says oat bake. I've never actually tried that myself, but it's all over Instagram. So, I would definitely go and try that. And <laughs> I think that's a great recommendation. Thank you even though it's boring. I don't think it's boring. I think oats is amazing. <laughs> okay, so I want to end by encouraging you to discover why you specifically may want to improve your health. A lot of us know that we want to be healthier, but understanding your unique desire will enable you to envision what health means to you. It might be so that you can move around freely or so that you can focus better. Maybe it's so that you can play in the garden with your children and be there to see them grow up. Maybe it's to prevent long-term diseases or alternatively to feel less sick on the daily. And maybe it's simply that you'd like to lose weight. There's nothing wrong with such a goal. But if this is your goal, then dig deep and discover why you'd like to lose weight. Is it so that your clothes fit better or so that you feel lighter on your feet? Understanding why you specifically would like to be healthier removes the burden of feeling forced to eat well. And once you've discovered your why, create a plan of action. We're all unique and we're unique changes to improve our health. So with everything you've learned today, carve some time in your day or week to decide which changes you personally would like to make. I hope I haven't overwhelmed you this afternoon with all this information, but rather that I've inspired you to prioritize both your own health and that of your employees, and that you leave today ready to implement some healthy eating habits into both your life as well as the office where possible. And as you do so, remember to meet yourself where you're at and start by making small, sustainable changes without an all or nothing mindset. Oh, and here's the, sorry, the end of the slides, here's the recipes, and here's why do you wanna be healthy? Thank you. So before I go, does everyone, anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Cool. Or you, if you guys have any questions, you can always do them on Instagram and tag me or tag um, Dynamic Body Technology. And yeah, the handout hopefully will 
give you a nice breakdown of what you need to remember going forward because it can be quite overwhelming and I think it helps to just have a little basic summary of what principles to apply so yeah thank you guys for having me and I, I hope you can include some of these tips into your own diets bye hi everybody are you guys able to hear me at the moment yeah you're good Awesome, awesome. I just wanted to check if all of you are happy for us to push through now and uh, finish the talk now. If you would like a five minute to 10 minute break, please let me know. You can just send a message in the chat as to what you'd prefer. Can go on now. Right. Mark, Amber, Rachel, you guys happy to go on now? Yep, go for yes. it. Yes. Okay, cool. So I'm also going to be sharing my screen with you. Give me two moments, please. All right. Hold on. Okay. So today's talk by me is called Movement is Medicine. And before we start, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Kelsey Rod, and I am the healthcare ambassador for Dynamic Body Technology. Here at Dynamic Body Tech, we deal with corporate wellness solutions, and we are basically trying to ensure that different uh, workplaces and workforces are able to be the healthiest environments possible. Not only physically, but um, mentally, financially, we are trying to make sure that corporates are looking after their employees and that everyone is doing their absolute best. So like I said, the title of the session is Movement is Medicine, where we are going to be looking at the importance of keeping active, of moving and grooving. So I have done my research on Quella and I have to be honest, I'm very excited that this is the corporate that we are dealing with today. Because from what I understand, Quella focuses very closely on the growth and development of women in all different aspects, you know, your career, mindset, confidence, senses of community, and all these different aspects. And obviously, as a woman, I feel extremely honored to have the opportunity to contribute to the well being of your workplace because you guys are the people that are going out every day with the purpose of helping other women. So it seems pretty cool that then we get to help you help other people. Um, so, my goal for today is to try and inspire each of you to live the healthiest lives you can. Um, which I guess will help maximize the way that you work and the way that you function as both a business and as individuals. So before we get started, I just wanted to see, um, I can see Griselda is on here. Um, are you able to let me know when we do some interactive stuff, the different answers possibly from a few people? I just want to know if that is a possibility. I can't even see, hold on one second. Just want to go back to Zoom so that I can actually see the chat box. How do I do that? I don't know how to see the chat box now. Hold on one second. I'm so sorry. Rich, do you know how? No, because I'm on PowerPoint. So I don't know how to. It's not can I make a, Kels, can I make a quick suggestion? If um, either Rachel or Ams monitors the chat box and gives you the feedback. Oh, there. You're so smart. Okay. And then you can, because okay. I don't have a full screen. So yeah, you run the full screen and one of the other two monitors the chat box. Okay, cool. That's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. Ams, uh, Ams. I'll Rachel, monitor, I'll monitor the, chat monitor the chat box. Okay. I'm so sorry. I feel like I'm technologically challenged and I shouldn't be. But anyway, so what we, um, what I want to do is I want to obviously get to know each of you a little bit first. But the first question I have for you guys is if you could acquire any new skill instantly, what would it be? I want all of you to respond. Everyone that is on this chat, please tell me what new skill you would want. Mine, personally, would be to learn every possible language on earth, basically, if I could do that at any point in time. Oh, flying. That's quite an interesting one. I like that. I like that. Mm. Scuba diving, that's interesting. Never even thought about scuba diving. Maybe I should be thinking about scuba diving. Sign language. 
I'm actually learning sign language at the moment and it's a really, a really great skill to have. I completely agree with you. Skiing, skiing is, that is a, a very hard one to master. I completely agree with you. Okay, so thank you all for responding. Oh, wait, what did that one say? We'd love to hear your experience. Maybe we connect afterwards. Of course, with sign language, of course we can. Um, I've, I'm very much in the beginning stages of it, actually learning it because my dad is losing his hearing. So it's been a really slow process of getting into it, but I found a really nice course that um, can be really useful. So I'll definitely share that with you afterwards. So the reason I like asking this question is because I feel like it's just a really good way to firstly connect with an audience and also to be able to understand the kinds of people that you're working with. Because when you think of a new skill, something that you so badly want to do or want to achieve, it either comes from a place of ambition or it comes from a place of talent or it comes from a place of real desire to just, I don't know, make a change in your life or do something out of the ordinary. So I think that um, this question is just a fantastic way to get to know people. As you've just seen, I mean, we're already having a conversation about sign language and that's something we have in common, you know, something that we would never have known we had in common. So thank you for sharing your answers with me, everybody. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay. So just to begin, I want to talk a little bit about what physical activity actually is, because of course we are um, focusing here today on movement and the idea of physical activity being a form of medicine. So according to the World Health Organization, physical activity is basically any body movement that requires you to spend your energy or use your energy. Why is this not changing? There we go. Okay, so it is the movements you make, the movements you do, whether it is during leisure time, whether it is during work, whether you're walking as a form of transport, it can be vigorous or moderate, it can be intentional or unintentional. That movement of your body is what we call physical activity. So, oh, sorry. So regular physical activity has been proven to help uh, and prevent manage help prevent and manage diseases such as obesity, heart disease, strokes, diabetes, and several cancers. I'm sure you guys have heard this kind of thing over and over again. And I'm not going to dive too deeply into it. However, I want to just explain how these kinds of things work. So on top of, of course, like managing our weight and managing um, the way that our food, our body processes food, the way that our immune systems and our metabolisms are maintained, physical activity is also really good for our brain. It's really good for our minds. So as well, as much as it manages obesity and heart disease and all of the different diseases that are often linked to eating unhealthy and being very inactive, physical activity is really, really good for the way that we behave. It's really good for the way that we work. And ultimately, it improves our quality of life in all aspects. Um, during lockdown, uh, I almost said last year, two years ago, when gyms were closed for a very long time, I know that so many people were frustrated and feeling even more anxious than they would have been. I mean, with already being in a pandemic because their usual exercise routine, their usual physical activity outlet was kind of taken away from them. And with that comes a very big strain on one's mental health. And I think something really important to note here is that often people don't realize the mental health and intellectual benefits of physical activity if they haven't had that consistently in their routine. So it's something that I would really encourage is just trying to obviously find what fits you. And that's where we're, what we're going on to next. So as adults, we should be doing two and a half to five hours of moderate intensity physical activity a week, which is something like walking, golfing, mowing the lawn or swimming. Or alternatively, you can do one and a half to two and a half hours of vigorous activity, which are things like cycling, soccer, netball, the really high intensity type stuff. Now, obviously, it's not one or the other. You can mix these. You will never be exactly within these, these time, uh, time frames. However, this is just a really good guideline to work off. And I don't know if you guys can see, but it seems very, like it actually doesn't seem like a lot. Like two and a half to five hours a week doesn't seem like that much. 
You know, neither does one and a half to two and a half hours of vigorous uh, intense activity. It doesn't seem like something that is un uh, unachievable. So this is the question that I want to discuss for the next few minutes. What does being, being active actually mean to you, right? So in this chat right now, all of us are different. We have different schedules, different responsibilities, different interests. But one thing that we all have in common is that we are busy people who want to live our lives in the best way we can. Okay, and this goes for um, firstly our physical health. You know, we want to be healthy enough to do all the things we have to do every day. We want to be able to um, focus on our work. We want to be able to, I don't know, be the best versions of ourselves. You know, it's such an important thing to wake up every day and feel like, cool, I am doing the best I can right now. And I think that being active. Um, is the one thing that can actually help us do that. So in order to live lives of success, balance and health, being active is a necessity. Whatever your personal circumstances are in terms of possible health limitations, busy schedules and busy uh, and personal preferences, of, of course, you know, being active is gonna look dif different to each of us. What I like, I can guarantee some of you won't. What you like to do, I might not. And that's perfectly fine, but what we need to do is find the kind of physical activity and the kind of, um, I guess, uh, exercise and stuff that fits our lives best, because otherwise there isn't really a point. Okay, so I want all of you guys to please answer in the chat the following few questions. So for me, favorite form of physical activity is 30 to 60 minutes in the gym, kind of doing weightlifting, that kind of workout. Do any of you consider this to be your favorite type of exercise please will you answer in the group you can just say yes or no nope haha <laughs> that's so funny okay okay well that's so far everyone said no you guys are proving my point very very easily thank you thank you for that all right okay so tell me do any of you enjoy yoga is that something that any of you would do yes or no Cool, yes, yes. Sometimes, fair enough. All right. No to yoga, yes to boxing, cool. All right, and boxing, walking the dogs, do any of these speak to you maybe a bit more than the weightlifting did? Because I know, I love walking my dogs, I love boxing, but yoga makes me want to pull my hair out. So, you know, we're all different here, which is very interesting. Yes, to walk in the dogs. Okay, cool. Okay, so we're getting some similarities now. That's awesome. Okay, and then I have a couple more for you. Swimming, Pilates, or dancing? Which one of these speaks to you? Or if any of them do? I mean, I truly can't swim to save my life, so I'm going to give that one a skip. But Pilates, maybe. Dancing, I'm, I wouldn't mind too much. Not that I'm very good at it, but, you know, we move. Stand up paddle. That sounds so cool. I don't like cold water. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, that's the thing. You're right. Swimming is quite a, a hard thing, especially if, even if people, like I have a swimming pool at home, but it's a very small swimming pool. So in order to actually make that swimming productive, I'd probably have to do about 60 laps because the pool is about the length of my body. And I'm a very short person. So I, I get what you mean. Gym memberships are often needed for that kind of stuff. <laughs> questionable talent yeah that's so funny <laughs> okay so thank you all for sharing your answers I think it's just interesting to be able to see the different interests that we all have you know we are all in I mean of course we work in different businesses and we we have different lives but it's just really interesting to think about this because often what happens is Imagine I came on this chat and I said to you, okay, in order to be successfully active, each and every one of you have to go spend an hour in the gym waiting, uh, lifting weights every day. You'd probably hate physical exercise or physical activity because you would be doing something that wasn't, I guess, fitted for you or your lifestyle. You know, you can't expect to enjoy exercise and to enjoy being active if you are doing something that you don't personally like. So it's just something to think about. We're going to get a bit more into that over the next few minutes. So 
when we talk about physical activity and why we have to be so careful with the kind of physical activity we choose is because it affects so many things in our health journeys. The first thing is commitment, all right? Obviously, if you are doing something you don't really want to do, so for example, me and swimming, um, it wouldn't work very well because I would dread going. I would never want to go to the gym to swim. And that would, of course, impact my commitments to it. You know, it would, it, it would impact the way that I feel towards it. It would impact the feelings um, that I had about physical activity as a whole. And if you aren't enjoying something, you can't be committed to it. And I guess that links very much to consistency. You know, you know this cliche saying consistency is key. Well, it really is. Because once you start getting into a routine where, you know, all right, cool either before work or after work, I'm going to pop into the gym, I'm going to do what I've got to do, and um, I'm going to enjoy it. it, becomes a lot easier to be consistent. But you can't do that if you are not enjoying the physical activity that you choose. And this, once again, it links to the idea of enjoyment. You know, I keep saying it, I'm going to, I'm going to keep using swimming as an example. I'm sure by the end of this, you'll really understand how much I despise swimming. But you can't possibly force yourself to do something that you hate all the time. You know, even if you're not meant to be swimming every day, swimming three to five times a week would actually make me cry. And no one would even be able to tell because I'd be in the water. So it would be quite depressing. And I think that finding something you enjoy will allow you to in turn seek the benefits that physical activity has to offer. You know, if you are going to um, going on a walk with your dogs, you know, you're going to look forward to that part of the day if that is something that you enjoy. My favorite thing, I do it every Saturday and Sunday morning. Um, I walk the dogs to the park. We go for a little walk around. We sit, we sit on the grass and lie in the sun a little bit, and then we walk home. And it is my absolute favorite part of my week. And it's because it's a type of, I actually don't even see it as, I don't think of it as going um, on a walk. I think of it as my me time with my puppies. You know, it's not even entrenched in my head as, exercise even though it is exercise because I've got this beautiful positive outlook on it because I enjoy it so much and that is something that allows me to I guess reap the rewards or feel the benefits of such exercise so the next thing is finding your ideal physical activity so there are three things that I want you all to consider first thing is you need to consider being experimental so we can't just guess what kind of physical, physical activity we might like or might enjoy. Um, for example, I have really bad knees and I have an ankle problem. And so for me, I, I remember very vividly, I once thought it was a fantastic idea to go to a boot camp class at the gym. I thought, oh, this is going to be fantastic. It's going to get my heart racing. I'm going to feel all excited and pumped up afterwards. Anyway, I walked out of there feeling like I had been hit by a truck because my knees and ankles ne nearly gave up on me. And so, listen, I was being experimental and maybe it didn't work to my advantage that day, but being experiment experimental is what also allowed me to find weightlifting. It's also what allowed me to find um, my walking or what allowed me to find spinning classes, the different kinds of things that I enjoy. So whether it be at the gym or at home, you know, you don't have to have a gym contract in order to be experimental. You can go on YouTube from your own home and you can go and find different workouts online. Um, we have a lot on our website. We have a lot on um, our YouTube page and our Instagram page um, uh, under Dynamic Body Tech, different workouts that I've shared. Um, you guys will also be getting a four-week workout guide that I created. So you can do those exercises at home and at the gym. You can explore, I mean, the internet has given us so access to so many different things that we should be exploring these different um, avenues. You know, you can go and search cardiovascular based exercise that make your heart race. You can go and do weight training um, with DIY weights. You know, during lockdown, I was using bricks in packets, ridiculous stuff like that. You know, you can do flexibility training or balance training, finding what suits you. You also need to identify the type of exercise that exercise that makes you feel good inside and out, so physically and mentally. Like I said, the boot camp class nearly broke my body. So for me, that wasn't the best thing. And then I also walked out feeling very concerned that my body was broken. So for me, that wasn't the best choice. Whereas when I went cycling, when I go do weightlifting, it's easier on my body and it makes me feel accomplished. It makes me feel 
I don't know, some sense of, of mental calmness, which is really fantastic. So exploring these avenues helps you identify what kind of exercise works for you. You also need to find the type of exercise that complements your lifestyle, all right? If, for example, I don't know, swimming or running is something that you really, really like. Let's go with running. I think that that's a really nice example, like road running. If you are working a job from 5, 6 a.m. till 7 at night, which very scarily lots of people do, um, it's often a bit unsafe then to run on the road at night or run early in the morning before the sun is up. I mean, some people love it, but for me, that's not personally something I would feel safe doing. So finding a different alternative, something that would suit your busy lifestyle, something that you can do safely in the hours that you are free, or not even safely, but something that you can do that won't make you burn out at the end of a long day. You know, what kind of exercise do you have access to while you are um, free? Does it mean lifting some weights while you're sitting at your desk in the office, doing some bicep curls? Does it mean... Um, I, I don't know, flexing your core and keeping your core tight the whole time you're sitting and working um, on an online meeting? Does it mean walking around perhaps and just getting some more steps in? You know, we, we all have completely different lifestyles. I don't know what your schedules are like, but I imagine they're busy. So it's just nice to consider the different ways that we can do this. So my biggest tip when it comes to finding exercise and physical activity routines is changing your perspectives. As you can see, the photo says, when you change the way that you look at things, the things you look at change. What this means is we can only see the things that we are, um, we only see a certain perception of things. We don't see further than what our minds are telling us to see. So this changing your perspective is very much a conscious process that I think is very, very useful. So what I mean by this is being able to move our bodies, that's a blessing, you know. Of course, everybody has health complications and there are always limitations to this statement, but overall being able to consider even being physically active and doing physical activity, that is a huge blessing. We need to take advantage of our ability to be active and we need to treat our bodies respectfully, you know, because ultimately looking after our bodies means being physically active. Because how the question that I posed earlier as well was how can we appreciate physical activity if we have negative perceptions towards it? And this is where changing our perspectives become import, becomes important. So these are some of the, the biggest, I guess, perspective changes that I've been working on in my life. So instead of saying at the end of the day, oh, it's five, six o'clock, I have to go to gym, I have to do it. No, I don't have to go to gym, I get to go to gym. How lucky am I? That firstly, I have a gym contract. And secondly, how lucky am I that I'm healthy enough to have worked a full day at work, um, done extra stuff after work, and then I get to still go to the gym. How lucky am I? Even if my energy is lacking slightly, how lucky am I that my body will allow me to do that? From going from, oh, but it's inconvenient, the time is inconvenient to, okay, maybe, but it's also a blessing. Again, my body is allowing me to do these things. Instead of saying it's a mission, saying, okay, maybe it is a mission at this exact point in time, but it's productive and it's going to make me feel better. It's going to help me later on. You know, these kinds of perspective changes, not only with relation to, to physical activity. I mean, you can apply this to anything in your life. You know, I often think about this when I really am struggling with balancing work and eating and um, socializing and physical activity and all the different aspects in my life sitting and trying to change my perspective and reminding myself how grateful I am to be busy, for example. How often do you guys sit there and go, I'm so busy, I have so much to do, I just don't feel like it, I just wanna stay home all day. I know I do that sometimes. And then I think, I think about it, I sit there and I'm like, wow, but I'm really lucky to be busy. I'm lucky to be working. I'm lucky to be doing the things that I get to do. You know, it's just a good principle, I think, to carry through life, but yeah. So, I, th I thought there were going to be more people on here, I'll be honest, but we're going to, we're going to work with, with what we got right now. Um, I want to ask you guys to, we're just going to do this, I think, as a group. Let's do this, all of us together. In the chat box, will each of you guys please write down or type out an idea that you think could be implemented in the workplace to try and, I guess, increase physical activity? 
So remember I said earlier something like doing bicep curls with some weights at your, at your desk or um, making sure that you're always keeping your core stabilized and um, tight so that you, you're working your core throughout the day. If you have any ideas, it can be something extravagant, it can be something so simple, please write your idea in the chat box. I just saw the camera, the lighting is not very good in here. I do apologize. And you just noticed this now. Any ideas, anyone? I wanna see if we can come up with something because if we can find something that everyone seems to like an idea that someone, um, everyone seems to think is doable. It's a really good starting place. Include a five minute physical activity in our morning huddle. We work remotely, perhaps each team member gets a day. That's really, and that's a really nice idea. I really like that. And that one said, I tried to sit on an exercise ball throughout the day, but my desk is too high. So I hurt my back, fair enough. But these are both really nice ideas. Perhaps for someone who um, has a, a lower desk or the desk is, is a better size, it could work. That's actually a really good core exercise. I like that, that, that idea that every week someone else can host. That's actually a really nice thing. That could even work for things like breathing exercises. Um, if you think about yoga and that kind of thing, you know, in the beginning of every week or the beginning of every day, you can do a five minute like meditation. You know, that's, that's also, that's still a form of, of maybe not physical activity if you're not moving, but it's still a form of, um, a health practice, you know, it's that's that could also really work. All right, dance off sale meetings. I love that. I love that. When you guys are fighting over um, oh, but you're working remotely. Okay, never mind. I was gonna say if you're working at the office and someone there's a line for coffee, the person who gets coffee first is the one who wins the dance off. Yeah, I think that could be really cool. I really like this idea. I think I want to implement this in my workspaces the idea of hosting every week someone else hosts well, thank you guys for sharing that's awesome I try to meet monthly for hikes and walks that's that's amazing that's amazing that's actually a really nice idea <laughs> all right that was very fun thank you so much guys hold on one second i just want to move this okay so quick question before we end off, how many of you track your steps, whether it be on a phone or a watch or anything like that? Okay. My phone does, amazing. Do you, Rach? I used to, but I got rid of my watch. Okay, <laughs> fine, fine, fine. Rachel says that she used to, but she doesn't anymore. Um, I usually do. I actually know that's that's not true. I used to always, and then my, I realized the watch was inaccurate, so I don't have it anymore. Pardon? It exactly, it can. All right. Has anyone? Okay, well, um, we're this isn't really relevant if if not all of us track our steps, but. I don't know if this is something that any of you have, as Rachel said, it can become toxic looking and being like, have I, track my, have I met my step goal for the day? But it is an interesting way to implement physical activity into your daily routine. So we are going to be implementing a workplace incentive for your um, team. Now, obviously, being online makes it, uh, working remotely makes it a bit more difficult, but in fact, it actually makes it more important. So I think that this is a really good um, conversation to be having. So I have found the most amazing app. Okay. It's called Stride Kick. It's free. It is absolutely fantastic. And it works on a leadership board basis, which means um, at the end of a certain period, there is going to be a leadership, a leadership board that basically ranks people from highest to lowest. That sounds very rough, I know. But what it is going to do is it is going to allow your workplace to basically compete or, um, I guess, incentivize you 
to try and get more steps in. And it's not about reaching the goal every single day, but it's about trying to do, well, I guess trying to live your lives a little bit more actively. So of course I said here, the goal is 10,000 steps each, um, be it through walking meetings or coffee breaks. But if you are working at home, walking meetings, I don't think are really going to happen. Because for me, a walking meeting would be okay. Um, for example, Mark would say to me, can we have a meeting today? Instead of sitting at a table how I am now, we'd go for a walk around the office block, which I guess is a bit more difficult if you're at home. But you can, listen, you can pace up and down your, your uh, study if that's something that you would like to do. But it's just about finding time and um, a time and place every single day to get a little bit more steps in in order to increase your heart rate and to make sure that you are doing some sort of physical activity, especially if you're working at home. So this Stride Kick app, is fantastic. We are going to be sharing the link with you that will allow you to join our um, the challenge that I've created. So we've created it specially for you guys. Um, at the moment, I'm the only participant on there, but that will hopefully change by the end of today or the end of the week. Um, and we are going to run this initiative from the 1st of April to the 30th of April. And what it's going to do is it is going to see how many of us are um, are basically um, reaching, not, I don't want it to only about reaching, reaching your step goals, but just more about being conscious of doing things that are physical, doing things that will make you um, improve your health every single day. You know, it's not about reaching that goal every single day. Some days it's not possible, you know, but some days you'll get more than that and that's perfectly okay. And the leadership board will take that into account. So yeah, I'm gonna get in touch with you guys and send you this link either, um, Mark and or myself will, and we will make sure that you can join this. It's free. Like I said, um, I think it will just be really fun to do such a cool thing um, together, even if you guys are working remotely. And as the previous slide said, the person on the top of the leadership board by the 30th of April will receive a personal trainer certified four week workout plan, a home and at home version, as well as a gift voucher and bragging rights, which, you know, bragging rights are always very fun. So I think you guys should participate in this. I think it will be really, really great. But yeah, thank you all for joining today. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask um, either Rachel or myself. Challenge accepted. Yay. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. And yeah, this app, you can just download it on your phone. You don't need any sort of um, smartwatch for it. So it's not um, a pain in terms of that. It's just a really, really nice app. Um, once you get the link, it will be very easy to join. You literally just click on it. It will, it will take you either to the app, app Store, the Apple Store, the App Store, or the Google Play Store, the Apple Store. The, I'm sure you know what I'm trying to say. It's not working. My, uh, not working. But yeah, it will take you straight to your, your App Store um, and you'll be allowed to download it and join for free. So thank you so much, everybody. If you have any questions after this, please feel free to message us either on our Instagram page, um, via email, however you prefer. But yeah, have a good afternoon, everybody. I don't know if Amber, Mark, or anyone else wants to say anything. Amzi, you wrap up? Um, I'm good. I don't have any questions or anything. Just want to say thank you so much to the Quelle ladies for being our guests today. And we hope that um, these sessions um, will inspire you to go on and incorporate some of these tips and tricks into your daily lives. Awesome, thank you everybody. We will share this, uh, a link to the playback as well for you guys to be able to access. Thanks everybody, bye.